In the last episode, we saw how Korea's Supreme Naval Commander, Lee Sun Shin, was removed from office and thrown into prison just as Hideyoshi's forces were massing for a second invasion. Lee Sun Shin's nemesis, Won Kyun, is now in charge of the Korean Navy. How's that going to work out? Stay tuned. As always, before we get going, please support my channel by hitting the subscribe and like buttons. And to all of you already subscribed, thank you. During the years of negotiation with China, the Japanese reduced their numbers on the southern coast of Korea until only a few thousand remained, a skeleton force holding Busan. After the farce of negotiations between Japan and China broke down in October 1596, Hideyoshi decided to invade Korea again. This second invasion will proceed quite differently from the first invasion back in 1592. This time, there's not going to be a massive armada heading back to Korea on a specific date. Instead, there's going to be a slow build-up of Japanese troops in Korea taking place over several months, reinforcing the skeleton force of a few thousand that never left Busan. These troop movements from the northern coast of Kyushu to Tsushima, then on to Busan, begin in early March 1597, Kato Kiyomasa's contingent leading the way. By the middle of August, a total of 141 500 Japanese have returned to Korea, a force nearly as large as in the first invasion. 121,000 of these men are ground forces, arrayed in a string of forts around Pusan, on the southeastern tip of Korea. The rest, about 20,000, are sailors in Hideyoshi's new and improved navy. The Koreans and the Chinese, watching all this, brace for another lightning-fast advance inland, a second Japanese push to take Seoul but it doesn't come. The Japanese, in fact, have no intention of trying to advance that far north. Hideyoshi's orders specifically state that his commanders are not to take Seoul. So, why have they returned to Korea? What's the goal of this second invasion? Well, that depends on who you're talking about. For Hideyoshi, the goal is largely to save face and demonstrate his power. He wants to punish the Koreans and show the Chinese that he is unbowed. And he wants to demonstrate to his own people, in particular to his daimyo, that anyone who resists him will pay a heavy price. For the daimyo themselves, however, the commanders who have been sent to Korea to deliver Hideyoshi's object lesson, the goal is somewhat different the conquest of the southern half of Korea. The plan is to wait until September, when the fields in Korea are ready to be harvested. They will then seize Chola province, Korea's breadbasket province, where so much of the nation's rice is grown, then spread out and secure their hold over Gyeongsang and Chungcheong provinces as well. It will be their consolation prize for the years of fighting and sacrifice that they have already invested in Korea. They just need to make sure that the campaign is bloody and punitive to satisfy Hideyoshi. While all this is going on, this gradual build-up around Pusan of Japanese troops, the Korean government is urging Supreme Naval Commander Won Kyun to lead the Korean Navy east to attack. But Won Kyun doesn't do so. He delays. And the Korean Navy, it's falling apart. 
Officers, alienated by Juan's erratic behavior and his drunken anger, are starting to ignore him and are even abandoning their posts. Juan is now in the impossible position that Yi Sun Shin had been in earlier in the war. The Korean government, because of Yi Sun Shin's earlier successes, expects miracles from the Korean Navy, and these expectations have now fallen to Won Kyun. Won is urged, then ordered, to attack the Japanese, to destroy them. Kyongsang Army Commander Kim Mung so and Commander-in-Chief Kwon Yul, making no move to launch a ground attack themselves, join in this chorus. Won Kyun must attack the Japanese! Why is he delaying? He must attack! Finally, on October 17, 1597, Won Kyun caves into the pressure and leads his fleet east. Japanese spies in the hills overlooking Hansan Island see him leave, leading a total of more than 200 ships. Word is immediately sent to the Japanese Navy, the Koreans are coming. Now, the Japanese Navy that Won Kyun is heading off to fight is not the same force that Yi Sun Shin had faced back in 1592. It's stronger. Heavy war galleys armed with cannons have now been added to the fleet. They're not as heavily built as the Korean Panokson or Kobukson, but they're still a great improvement over the lightly built ships the Japanese typically used. Japanese commanders also have a better grasp of naval warfare. They've learned from fighting Yi Sun Shin that they can't just charge blindly at the Koreans and expect to win. Finally, they're more coordinated and unified than before. The Japanese Navy in 1592 had been composed of numerous independent units operating without much coordination. In 1597, these almost private navies have been brought together into a single cohesive fleet. Hideyoshi has accomplished this by appointing Konishi Yukinaga, now back in his good graces, to high naval command. Konishi will ensure that commanders like Kato Yoshiaki, Todo Takatora, and Wakizaka Yasuharu all work together for the same purpose. Okay, so back to August 1597. The Korean Navy, under Won Kyun, is heading east to do battle. It skirts the south coast of Koje Island and turns north, heading toward the Japanese perimeter of forts on the mainland. In the vicinity of Angolpo, they surprise and destroy a small group of Japanese ships. They then proceed east, hugging the coast, heading toward Pusan, when they reach the mouth of the Nakdong River on August 29th, they run into the bulk of the Japanese Navy, an armada of more than 500 ships, stretched out in a massive battle line. It's late in the day, the Koreans are tired and hungry after hours of rowing, and the time and place is of the enemy's choosing. It's not a good setup, but Won Kyun, displaying more of that erratic behavior that Yi Sun Shin had warned about, now charges in. The Japanese now show how much they've learned. Even though they greatly outnumber the Koreans, they don't meet Won Kyun's attack head on. Instead, they fall back, forcing the Koreans to row their heavy warships into the wind to chase them. It's only when the Koreans are thoroughly exhausted from rowing and the sun is going down that the Japanese finally attack. They overwhelm and destroy 30 Korean ships and throw the rest of Won Kyun's fleet into a disordered retreat in the growing darkness. The Korean Navy falls back to Chilchon Strait on the north coast of Koje Island. It has just suffered its greatest loss since the start of the war, when Kyongsang Navy commanders Pak Hong and Won Kyun sank their own fleets. Commander-in-Chief Kwon Yul is so angry that when he comes out to reprimand Won Kyun, he slaps him in the face. This blow, common among the lower ranks, but a rare insult at such a high level, 
throws Wan Kyun into a deep depression. For an entire week, he leaves the Korean Navy sitting in Chilchon Strait, vulnerable and exposed in the narrow channel. His commanders urge him to move the fleet to a safer location, to do something. But Wan does nothing. The defeat off Pusan, the slap from Kwon Yul, it has evidently driven him over the edge. The end comes in the early hours of October 28, 1597, shortly after midnight. The Japanese fleet, under Konishi Yukinaga, Todo Takatora, Wakizaka Yasuharu, and Kato Yoshiaki, appear at the north end of Chilchon Strait and attack. The Koreans, demoralized, leaderless, and unaccustomed to fighting at night, fall back down the strait in a disordered retreat that quickly turns into a rout. Chola Wright Navy Commander Io Ki, Yi Sun Shin's stalwart right hand earlier in the war, is killed. So is Chung Chung Navy Commander Che Ho. Won Kyun's own flagship is run aground and its crew flees into the hills, abandoning their commander. Glancing back, they see Won Kyun, older and slower, being hacked to pieces by Japanese sailors. His body will never be recovered. By dawn, almost the entire Korean Navy, 200 ships, has been destroyed. The only senior commander to survive the disaster was Kyongsang Wright Navy Commander Bae Sol, one of the officers who had urged Won Kyun to move the fleet to safety. When Won refused, Bae Sol quietly shifted twelve of his ships to a secluded inlet further down Chilchon Strait. When the Japanese attacked, he didn't stick around to fight. He fled. Bay would be strongly criticized for this, most severely by Yi Sun Shin, who would brand him a coward. News of the total destruction of the Korean Navy caused a panic in government circles in Seoul. The Western faction, responsible for replacing Yi Sun Shin with Won Kyun, was momentarily silenced. The Easterners reasserted themselves, and Yi Sun Shin was restored to command. Did Yi Sun Shin accept the commission when it arrived in the South? Of course he did. This was part of his greatness, that he would step up again to defend his country even after his own government had humiliated him and nearly ordered him killed. He set out on an inspection tour to assess the extent of the damage. What he found was that Basol's twelve ships was all that remained. With this tiny force, Yi Sun Shin would set out to stop the Japanese Navy. In the weeks that followed, he would ascend from Korean war hero to war god. <laughs>